Albert Prescott. What tribe are you from? Ah, Dawakan Tuansu and Siston Wapton tribe. How long have you lived in this area? I've been here 63 years. Your family's always been in this area? Well, my grandparents or my my dad and them were born in Shakopee. That's down 100 miles east of here. And uh, they moved up here in 1907. I was born in 1913 here on this reservation. Lived here since. My name is Art Gutthunder. I belong to the Budokan to a Bikuti tribe. And I lived here all my life. I'm 71 years old. I was born here. And my mother is a Budokan to a Bikuti. All right, I think that's good. My name is Art Guttunder, and I live in the Lower Sioux community, Morton, Minnesota. And as far as I could remember, it seems to me like the times are the same as it was 35 years ago in the 30s. And we, had, we had a drought just like this last year, and most of the people on the reservation, I think, work out until the reorganization act came in. And they really had a hard time. Wages were poor and there was no work. And later on, some of the people went off, left the reservation, get jobs any place they could go. But like me, I worked, I stayed here and I worked in the quarry for a good many years. It was hard work, but there was nothing else. I stayed there till I retired in, on disability in 1964. And the people, I think, didn't have enough land to farm them years, so they went out and worked. And the t right now, the people, only a few of them are farming, not too much. The rest of them are out, go out and find jobs wherever they could go. And of course, up till now, they made a lot of improvements on the reservation. A lot of people got wells, improvement on their houses, and it's a little, they live in a little bit better comfort than they did years ago. Years ago, they didn't have no lights. Some of them didn't have water. That's about all I can think of right now. Uh, my name is Albert Prescott. I am from the Lower Sioux. I was born and raised here on the Lower Sioux Reservation. And uh, we used to live on a three and a half acre farm down below the hill here, right across from the brickyard. That was all the Wakanton land at that time. And uh, after a while we went and started in, in the community here and they built up new homes, remodeled these homes on the reservation. There was no such thing as electric lights or anything. We didn't have no power to, for that purpose, but in the later years we've gotten them in these homes. Uh, 
after the Reorganization Act that came back in 1934, is when the government bought small acreage it, and uh, they couldn't hardly support a family with it so they had to get out and work in different areas. I was on one of those farms I worked on there as long as I could stand it and then I had to leave because of my family I couldn't support them on it and I had to go out and work and at the end I got a job with the state and I've been working with the highway department for the last 18 years up until last February I, I re retired now I'm on Social Security get a little state pension uh, My name is Art Guttunder, and I live in the Lower Sioux Reservation, Morton, Minnesota. And I lived here all my life. And years ago, it was kind of rough because there was no jobs. In the 30s, we had a draw just like we got this year. And uh, there wasn't hardly any work. So after a while, I went to work in the quarry, and that's where I stayed until I retired in 1964. And in, night, in the 30s, the people had it really rough because they didn't have electric lights. And a lot of the places didn't have water. At that time, the, they didn't get too much help from the government. So they really had it rough. And some of, the, some of them had big families. Is that all you want to know about the time now? Okay, you might pass it over to us. My name is Albert Prescott. I've lived here on a Lower Sioux reservation here all my life. Uh, I lived about a mile and a half north of here, down by the brickyards. I've uh, We only lived on a three and a half acre track of land down there, and somehow we we survived all these years. But it was rough. It was there was no employment. How we got along those years, I don't know. But we've in 1934, I was uh, no about 21 years old, and I when they started out with their self-government here. And there was more land bought up on the Lower Sioux, approximately 1,000 acres. And, uh, and we got on one of these plots of land, 40-acre plots. And uh, it was hard going, but we made it. We, I raised a family of nine kids on the place, although I didn't make it on farming, I had to get away from the reservation and work off, off the reservation, and finally went on to, uh, finally went on and got a job with the state, and I worked with them for 18 years until I retired.
back in February 3rd of this year. I have drawn Social Security and I get a little state pension. Uh, here at our mission, the Bishop Pupil Mission, where we had a missionary by Mrs. by the name of Mrs. Salisbury. And uh, people would go there and meet with him. And, and uh, I think uh, he, he was acquainted with all the people on the reservation here. And when uh, the self-government started, well, he was, uh, when he first introduced it, he, uh, we had meetings with him, and he explained the whole program to us. And when that was uh, back about in 33, I'd say, I wouldn't say for sure just what the days were, but when he met with the people here and he explained the whole thing, uh, this self-government to them. And at that time, self-government under the Johnson and Mellie, our, our school children wouldn't have to go to Pipestone, to the Indian school up in Pipestone. They would be left at home here, and they would be financed for their education through Johnson and Mellie. And that we could open up our Indian school here again, which was closed at that time. So, uh, these were all explained to the people, and, and they took a vote on it, and uh, what sold them out the most is the younger people were landless, and uh, uh, they wanted to expand our reservation. So we've uh, uh, we voted on it, and the people all went along with it, and that's how we got to accumulate another thousand acres for our community here. And under that program, there was a revolving credit fund which the people were could use for livestock for farming equipment. And I think they gave them their seed for the first year. And that's we went with and we've, uh, and that's how we got started with our farming. Do you have anything to add to that, Art? Yeah, that's pretty close. <laughs> Don't you want You got that running? Oh, <laughs> well they had, uh, they had ten thousand dollars, you know, for revolving funds. See, the government gave the Indians, but they had to pay it back. But the Indians only had to pay; they only had to pay three percent interest. See, so that went along for three, four years. But you know, the farmers couldn't make make a living on them small acreage, so the funds weren't coming in. So they at, finally they abolished it. See, and we paid the government back and. It had a little left, but I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> it, it was uh, this uh, $10,000 that we owed them. There was a portion of it paid back by the community, and the balance was, uh, it was a 10-year program. And when the 10 years came up, we had a, we had a balance of maybe 7000 to pay back, which we used some of our community land, and we sold timber off of that land to pay back this delinquent debt we had. And uh, after we did that, then the government decided we should keep that $10,000 for our community. And there we've used that uh, $10,000 for, it was uh, on an IIM account or something in that order. And uh, it went on till we got uh, and then we start selling gravel, and it, we had an accumulation of money coming in. We had that $10,000 seated. And, uh, and once in a while, the people from the Bureau would come down and ask what we wanted to use this money for. And we, uh, uh, we couldn't decide what we wanted it for. It wasn't quite enough to help everybody in the community, so we kept it in there, and we used, uh, and then at the same time, we sold some more timber. And then we had gravel that we sold, some 
from and I think our, it accumulated up to 80 some thousand dollars which we left with the Bureau in uh, Bemidji. They handled our affairs at the time. So after a while when they came down again and they asked us the same question, what are you going to use this money for? Well we said we'd use it for a uh, fuel supplement and that's how we opened up a community uh, fuel supplement for each winter and uh, it didn't take long, we used it up. I think when you figure when you use twelve, fifteen thousand dollars each winter for that purpose, it doesn't take long to get rid of it. And there was no other income coming in at the time. But in the same time, we had some of the people that had de deceased, their assignments were canceled, and that went into a community fund. So we've always got a community fund growing for us. Uh, right now, I don't know offhand how much uh, money we have in there now, but or how many acres that is being rented out. But I think most of that uh, bottom land down in the, in the bottom area is all community land. And then there's some on the reservation on top of the hill here too that went into that. So, I don't know, Art, do you got anything else to add? I had 800 acres. I would say they're maybe. They're divided up and yeah, it's it about was 19 acres. Mm -hmm. A lot like I got here is 19 acres. Mm -hmm. That's this the way they're all divided up here, the whole allotment. We can explain that. Yeah, that's uh, that's about 20 acre plots for them to walk into a Sioux tribe. Although it's broken up in such a, in such a way that some places a person would have a a seven acre plot for woodland yeah, some of them. and then some of them have a certain uh, acreage for field land so uh, one per person could have maybe two or three allotments but it only amounts to about 20 acres or something in that order but when the, under the reorganization act um, we were it was introduced all over, nationwide, I think, to the Indian people. And uh, I think Mr. Uh, ben Rifle was introduced it in uh, South Dakota reservations, where their system of government is uh, far different than what we have here in our reservation here. But, uh, and there, after introducing it to all these other reservations, they've, uh, they turned it down because there was an inheritance involved in it and they wanted to save it for their own children their own individual allotments but here an allotment the way it stands uh, when the party that it's assigned to is deceased it's canceled out and it's given to the community it goes back into a community land So I can't uh, really say what the acreage is, but uh, um, when, uh, but that's what we're looking uh, out for now is uh, to try to keep the home sites and the acreage could go into a community fund for the people for fuel supplements through the winter months. I know art here and I feel the same way about it when we're gone there'll be only a home site left for whoever the heirs may be and they in turn will be getting a fuel supplement through the winter months for them although we have 20 acres now and he's got 20 acres and I've got oh, 45 acres of tillable land there but that that is a program which I don't really know who started or who approved of or what but it's, that's the way it's going. Uh, you got anything to add, Doc? No, that's about it, I think. Oh, of course, I was pretty young then, before I considered myself a young man, but <laughs> me too, I, I didn't take too much interest in it, but it's just what I hear. How old were you? When you first heard about this Indian Reorganization Act and your tribe could reorganize, all that happened there. Okay. Well, 
when the reorganization act started in here on the reservation, the superintendent from Pipestone and his assistants came down here and they called a meeting, you know, and I don't think the people were aware of the such a sudden change, you know. But, you know, everything sounded so good to them that they accepted it right then and there, see. And I've heard the people say that there were some people included in making the bylaws, but I don't see how they could make them so fast. I think the government just made the bylaws and they had the committee agree to it. And that's how the bylaws have been standing since 1935. And some of them the people don't approve of now and they want to have them change. But it's, it's a kind of a hard proposition, but I guess they're finally getting to it. So about that act, you know, they even brought the old horses from Pipestone School, you know. And you know that some of them horses are ready, ready to quit working, you know, just like older people. <laughs> and the machinery they bought for the Indians, it wasn't, you know, it was second-handed, and it wasn't as good as four horses, I figure, a tractor, you know, F-14 or whatever they call it. It wasn't, it wasn't able to do the work properly, you know, because the equipment wasn't heavy enough. And then a few of them got a few cows. Every farmer around here sold cows to the Indians. I suppose they sold the poorest cow they had to the Indians. I don't know, but that's the way it looked to me. <laughs> they just wanted to get rid of their machinery and whatever they didn't need. You want to add to this, Albert? Well, yeah, I, uh, I couldn't really, I'm not too familiar with this, but uh, at one time, when they first started your Indian Reorganization Act, I think the first year they worked on this, um, it was a charter. They went by a charter. And it took a whole year before they come up with uh, uh, the, the bylaws for the community. And this is what we're standing on right now, as of now. But of course, like you say, we're changing our bylaws, and I imagine it'll be a while before we can approve of them. It's got to be a, a, the people in the community to vote on these bylaws. You know, if, if you might be going through uh, making these bylaws up, but at the end, uh, if the majority of the people don't approve of it, well, then we'll have to go through the whole thing and process again, and going through a, another cycle for our bylaws. Uh, I would say uh, when we uh, start using our 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 community funds, which the purpose I think of it was for the bureau people wanted us to expand our community. If we could get in another, well, got it up to a hundred thousand dollars, why they could buy up more land for the community and expand our community. But some way or other, we, uh, we never got that far with it. The people wanted this money for, they figured a better purpose by, by getting fuel, a fuel supplement for themselves. And, and that's the way it stands. Now we've dwindled down to a, uh, it was a kind of a, not really, but uh, it would. farmer, he's got about a thousand acres, you know. Yeah, that's true, but uh, but uh, the bureau people had that in mind that they would buy more land for the people and to buy a, put up m more home sites in our reservation. Um, if uh, if they went if uh, we had saved that money for that purpose, but then there's another drawback there. When we had a community fund going, a lot of our programming we were not eligible for. So this was discussed and uh, people said, well, why not get rid of our community fund and, uh, and so we can get in on some of these programs that are coming up. And it is dwindled down and we are getting some of these government programs in for our Indian people. So I, I don't know, have you got any more to add to this? I, no, I don't think so.
Yeah, when this uh, Indian reorg uh, Reorganization Act started, we had a five-member council, which uh, consisted of a president, a vice president, a secretary, a secretary, you know, a treasurer, and a secretary treasurer. And these were voted in by the community people. And that was uh, what we, we've always had it that way. We've always had a five-member council on the reservation here. But, uh, and as years went on, we've always changed different council members. And, and uh, in fact, uh, there's not very many of those old council members living today. I imagine Tom Bluson would be one of the older ones. It'd be the, about the only one I can remember. When they fir when that first when that first council was elected, I know there was Sam Bluestone, George St. Clair, Tom Bluestone, and if I recall, uh, it was Moses Columbus, and and uh, who would have been the third or fourth one? Yeah, I mentioned him, and uh, I just can't recall the fifth one. But anyway, it's always been five-member council. Could it have been Gertrude Blue, the first one, one of the first ones? She's still living. Um, and um, and that's when we, and everything we've done, it had to be, it was recommended by the council, and it was into, sent into the Bureau of Indian Affairs or in Pipestone. Uh, and we tried to. It was only recommendations. We could only recommend these things. And it is with their approval that these programs or whatever they were asking for would be, uh, would be final. So this is why right now the younger people don't realize that we have uh, we have some overseers over us in a community like this. We just can't go out and go down here in the woods and cut wood and sell it to the outside of the reservation or do anything like that. We have guidelines to follow on our reservations here. And uh, I don't know if I could interpret it in any other way. It is restricted land that we're living on and any time you're on a non-taxable piece of land, there's somebody over you as an authority to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. And this has always been the case. But the uh, younger generation now feel that they could do this and they can do that, but uh, that would put our community into jeopardy. How are they different? Are they still the same? I think most of them problems that come up now were uh, problems of years ago too, you know, but, you know, we didn't have much authority like Albert said. So we just have to kind of follow their orders and do what, try and get by, see? And when I was a chairman, I don't know, it's pretty hard to satisfy all the people, you know, you'd have to, any issue that came up, you probably have to go along with and try to make the best of it because first place a chairman that ain't supposed to vote till some, like, it's just like a city council, see. The chairman don't really have the, the say, but the, up here, you know, that something comes up and goes wrong, they, they jump the chairman, you know. <laughs> But that's a regular habit up here, you know, and instead of blaming the whole council, they blame the chairman. There he is, see, and he, in the first place, he hasn't, he don't decide till the, the other councilman decides. He didn't, if it's a tie vote, then he has a vote. It's just like a city council. And there wasn't too many issues brought up at the time when I was a council, and, and the money was kept at Bemidji. We couldn't, and that was the thing that, and the, lately, that the money 
but it was handed to the consul, see? And that's where we're having so much trouble now because the people, you know, everybody wants the money, see? And just like when we, we allowed uh, fuel oil for the people that are living up here, but then, you know, you got into friction and people wanted, from town wanted to get in on it. And so it was a, quite of a contest amongst the councilmen to decide, but the people, it don't make no difference what you do, there'd be some of the people that are going to holler, see. So we try to get along as the best we can, and, and being on a council, you know, is, is a, quite a job, because they got their hands tied, and they have to go by the bylaws, and, and something comes up, and then the, the agent or somebody else has to come down and try and straighten out, and it's getting to be beyond getting things straightened out, but I guess now they're trying to change the bylaws a little bit and have things better controlled. And I think they should have more to say, you know. But, but it'll all come out in the wash, I hope. Is that enough? Do most of the people work out the reservation? Most of the people are still working out. And there's a very few farmers. Albert here is about the only one that's farming right now. But you know, I don't see how people on this ground on the hill here can make a living on 80 acres even. Because you can't produce that much. It's sandy and if you don't get rain, it's just, you're just out of luck. You know, you're lucky if you can get your seed back like this year. So I can't see, even in the future, I can't see the people going into farming. So I don't know. Up to 34, most of, the, most of the people talk Indian on the reservation, except the smaller children. Now you take in my family, there must have been, a, there was 12 of us, I think, 11. And uh, I could say that my younger sister and younger brothers, they talk very little in, Indian, see? And then still my dad and my father talk Indian all the time, see? And, but our older ones, we talk good Indian, you know. And But the younger generation, they just died away from it. And the public schools don't allow people, I mean, even the Pipestone School didn't allow them to talk Indian, see? At that time, I never went to school in Pipestone, but my wife did, and she said they weren't allowed to talk Indian in school. So she, she can't talk Indian today yet. She's trying to learn, but we start talking Indian, and pretty soon we're talking English, see? Now they're trying to bring that back. They even have in Morton School here, they're teaching Indian language. And I think it's a great thing. And our minister here, he just come about a year ago and he, he's quite interested in Indian culture and stuff and he's trying to bring it back. So, even as old as I am, talk Indian all of my life and some days I can't think of some words in Indian. <laughs>
when it comes down to, uh, to make the real decisions, then they jump in. decisions that uh, yeah self determination is right is good if we had our uh, bylaws revised stuff like that we haven't got it done yet uh, we're on our old bylaws yet until this is approved by the commissioner of indian affairs we have to go along with our old bylaws that's the air no and uh, we don't know when this will be when this will come about. Uh, I, uh, I just, uh, we're just starting now. Uh, uh, the council is working on each household and asking what they want in their bylaws, on these new bylaws. And when this is all taken care of and it'll be put into a book form and be read to the people in the community and uh, they in turn will vote on it and that will be our revised uh, bylaws for the Lower Sioux community. What are some of the bylaws having trouble with? Want to well, there's a lot of these people would this like to leave. Small reservation fee and, and uh, some of the people live in town and they're off the rotation. Yeah, that is one of the well, issues. Get, uh, rights like the rest of the Indians because they haven't got too much to live on either. In a way, there seems to be, should be entitled to what we get. I live on a reservation. If I get some fuel oil, I live in Morton. It's only a mile and a half from here. And it seems like they should be entitled to it, too. So that's one of the troubles, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else can you that think? Beats, uh, like you say, you, know, you live on a reservation, you're on tax-free uh, land, and you don't have to pay any rent, you don't have to pay any... Uh, and uh, that's where they, they feel that being that they're living off the reservation and they had to pay rent and everything and they say they think they should be entitled to the fuel oil supplement and which is uh it kind of holds water too that's and you think that 10 mile radius. and that's why they're asking for a 10 mile radius of the reservation well some say when you go 10 miles why don't you go 100 miles but within that 100 miles you're covering the upper Sioux, you're covering the Prior Lake area, and, and it'll even take in part of the uh, Minneapolis area. So uh, these are some of the issues that have uh, been spo uh, spoken of and been discussed, and we don't know yet just what uh, what's going to become of it. And uh, there is a little... Uh, Which bylaws are you planning improving or changing? Well, each one, each individual is going to be able to go out and speak their own minds what they want. And this is what we're trying to do now, is to get them to give, a, give their own opinions and then the biggest majority of the people will, I suppose, will, and then the council will approve of those. It isn't going to be one individual making up these bylaws, it's going to be the whole community, and this is good. But the problem that in came, the past is that it's been one individual? Been well, no, not necessarily. No, it is up to the council mm -hmm. to do these things. What I guess in some areas they claim the council is the one that uh, makes up their bylaws. Well, here it is going to be a different thing. It's going to be the community, the people living in the community to decide these points. Uh, Well, it's supposed to be ever, what is it, ever two years? Ever two years. And there again, we have uh, different programs going where uh, they want to alternate. Say maybe a chairman will be put in for a four-year period, and then the secretary maybe two years, 
uh, always keep one of the old council members in there so that they know what programs are pending and what's going on. Otherwise, if you uh, start up a new a new council, not knowing what the programs were in effect and which ones are going coming in effect, uh, it kind of creates a problem to them. And, uh, some of them are not interested in it, something like that, and they fall through for us. So. In this way, if we could get somebody in there with a on a on a four-year term, and uh, they can bring up the new council onto all these programs, what they're going to do, and what uh, what uh, we have uh, hip programs, and oh, we have a CETA program. I don't know if you have that in Wisconsin, and stuff like that. And these here could be you know, going on for next month or so, and it could be a they could be uh, cancel out maybe in the next week or so. And so these are some of the problems we are looking to so that we know how much, how long one program is going to go and how to program it on the reservation itself. Uh, how strong is the current tribal government as compared to like the 1934 reorganization? Well, let's say they are, uh, uh, as a council, when we first started, there was no such a thing as a salary for the council member, any of the council members. But now, there's other programs, federal programs, which comes out and they pay their expenses and maybe give them a small salary, which is not in our bylaws, but they are doing these things for the, for the council. That I understand is... And then there's, uh, under the public health, you have, uh, we have a uh, woman here that... Yeah, well, before 1934, this was all but the Wakantone land. There had been approximately 700 acres here. And uh, these were 20-acre plots. And a lot of it was not all farmland either. There was uh, there was woodland, and I'd say most of it was a uh, side hill. You take from for about a mile and a half down uh, west from here, it was all side hill, and just a few acres of of uh, farmland. And uh, I was thinking well back how. It didn't even pay some of the Indian people to farm this land. They didn't have the equipment to go ahead and farm it. So a lot of this land laid idle for years. Remember old man Rock over here, Art, when he used to have that piece of land? That used to be up in weeds about now, about so high. Nobody farmed it. Nobody cared to farm it because uh, those were, oh, you might say ancient times when everybody was uh, with horse and with horses and stuff like that. That was back in maybe, oh, 25 or uh, 24, somewhere in there. And uh, uh, some of where we have, where our place is now, those people used to farm that 160 acres there with horses. So they had all they could handle with what uh, equipment they had. So this land used to lay idle. It's Biggest share of it. Yes. Uh -huh. If you had some choice land, maybe somebody would be interested in it. But if you didn't, well, then they didn't want to bother with it. And that stuff all laid idle. But after they got the tractors and more modern machinery, why uh, they start expanding? Why heck, some of these farmers could could run a section of land of their own off the reservation and still come in here and try and take everything they can get on here too. And that's what's happening now. So in the, in the latter years, uh, when this went into community land here, uh, this land is all put out on bids to the highest bidder. And it could be non-Indian. Uh, most of it is non-Indian. There's hardly any Indians that's farming any of this land. Um, but it all goes into to the highest bidder, and uh, uh, 
and this goes into our community funds. But this has to be approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You, uh, you, you got it on now. Oh, well, I was going to think about it. I was going to ask a question here, but then, okay. Uh, as a community, we are, I, I can't see where, with the acreage we have, that I would try to say that we, our kids could benefit or profit from a community like this. It is only, and as things stand, we're only going to have leave, when we leave, we leave a home site. And without employment on a reservation, how could our younger people survive unless they were employed in the area, within the area or something like that? These are some of the things I often wondered. I, I did wish that some of, uh, we had some sort of security for them when we leave them so that they can carry on with it. But by just going as we are and leaving them just a home site, they're gonna struggle just like our ancestors and us and everybody else. That is my opinion. I, uh... Well, looking back on the past 40 years, what things would you change? Or did you feel would be different if you could go back? I was looking for security at that time for myself. Um, I wished that I could leave my own kids with some sort of uh, oh, some sort of security that they can carry on with. Because when our parents died, they left with us with nothing. We had just a little tribe of land here that we could live on, survive with. But if we could better ourselves by giving them a little bit more to go and get an education and things like that, even the grandchildren, if they could just uh, live a better life and to get a education and to get out in public more. I don't like to isolate my kids, kids right on the reservation here. They don't know what goes on on the outside world. They're just living within the four mile square area here, you might say. Uh, it's hard to uh, uh, experience, their, their experience is limited to the outside world. It's, uh, that's about it, I can't think of anything else. Uh, I don't know if I could add to that. I don't have no children, so I don't know what, you know. <laughs> but there's one thing about living on the reservation like me, I would have had a hard time if I had to move in town and, and work for wages and like I, I'm well satisfied with the home I got here because I don't have to pay taxes. A lot of people don't realize what that is, t paying taxes, you know, through the years, you know, like me living for... I was married in 44, and I've been living here, and I made some improvement in my house on my own. There was no light here, uh, no basement. But just through working, working out, I we save a little money, and we'd fix something here and there. And as long as we got, don't have to pay rent, that amounts to quite a bit of money in a year's time. So. I would suggest that some of the younger people, if they live, could could live on the reservation and work out and have a decent job, I think they could still make a pretty good living. But you know, you can't. There ain't that many room for that many people on the hill either, unless they make improvements or make improve houses and projects and stuff like that. Of course, they have done quite a bit by putting in wells and fixing some of the homes. So there's quite a bit of improvement since 34 is my notion. Some of the people are living halfway decent, you know, and you take a lot of visitors that come through the reservation here, they, they, they often wonder where the reservation is, see? And so they could see that much improvement. 
That is, for a good number of years, it never got nothing, you know. So there's some improvement. What do you think, Albert? I can't think of anything else. Good Thunder. I belong to the Budokan to the tribe. And I lived here all my life. I'm 71 years old. I was born here. And my mother is a Budokan to Akbekute. Alright, we can get through. Thank you. My name is Art Guttunder, and I live in the Lower Sioux community, Morton, Minnesota. And as far as I could remember, it seems to me like the times are the same as it was 35 years ago in the 30s. And we, had, we had a drop just like this last year, and most of the people on the reservation, I think, work out until the reorganization act came in. And they really had hard times. Wages were poor and there was no work. And later on, some of the people went off, left the reservation, get jobs any place they could go. But like me, I worked, I stayed here and I worked in the quarry for a good many years. It was hard work, but there was nothing else. I stayed there till I retired in, on disability in 1964. And the people, I think, didn't have enough land to farm them years, so they went out and worked. And the t right now, the people, only a few of them are farming, not too much. The rest of them are out, go out and find jobs wherever they could go. And of course, up till now, they made a lot of improvements on the reservation. A lot of people got wells, improvement on their houses, and it's a little, they live in a little bit of better comfort than they did years ago. Years ago, they didn't have no lights. Some of them didn't have water. That's about all I can think of right now. That's now. Uh, my name is Albert Prescott. Uh, I'm from the Lower Sioux. I was born and raised here. Over to the 
Conservation and uh, we used to live on a three and a half acre farm down below the hill here, right across from the brickyard. That was all for the Wakanton land at that time. And uh, after a while we went and started in the community here and they built up new homes, remodeled these homes on the reservation. There was no such thing as electric lights or anything. We didn't have no power to, for that purpose, but in the later years we've gotten them in these homes. Uh, under the Reorganization Act that came back in 1934 when the government bought small acreage it's, and uh, they couldn't hardly support a family with it so they had to get out and work in different areas. I was on one of those farms I worked on there as long as I could stand it and then I had to leave because of my family I couldn't support them on it and I had to go out and work and at the end I got a job with the state and I've been working back on My name is Albert Prescott. I've lived here on a Lower Sioux reservation here all my life. Uh, I lived about a mile and a half north of here, down by the brickyards. I've uh, We only lived on a three and a half acre track of land down there, and somehow we we survived all these years. But it was rough. It was there was no employment. How we got along those years, I don't know. But we've in 1934. I was uh, no about 21 years old, and I when they started out with their self-government here. And there was more land bought up on the Lower Sioux, approximately 1,000 acres. And, uh, and we got on one of these plots of land, 40-acre plots. And uh, it was hard going, but we made it. We, I raised a family of nine kids on the place, although I didn't make it on farming, I had to get away from the reservation and work off, off the reservation, and finally went on to, uh, finally went on and got a job with the, with the highway department for the last 18 years, up until last February, I, I retired. Now I'm on Social Security, get a little state pension. My name is Art Guttunder, and I live in the Lower Sioux Reservation, Morton, Minnesota. And I lived here all my life. And years ago, it was kind of rough because there was no jobs. In the 30s, we had a draw just like we got this year. And uh, there wasn't hardly any work. 
uh, after a while I went to work in the quarry and that's where I stayed till I retired in 1964. And in, night, in the 30s the people had it really rough because they didn't have electric lights. And a lot of the places didn't have water. At that time the, they didn't get too much help from the government. So they really had it rough. And some of the some of them had big families. 